So the subject for my final presentation for the conference is data security basics. Data security is obviously something that is of critical importance to people in our industry these days and the people who rely on the software that we provide to them. Whether that's through regulation, through things like HIPAA or PCI or Europe's new GDPR regulations, California's upcoming Privacy Act, or whether it's just the right thing to do to protect the data of the people who interact with our systems and have data held within our systems, clearly we all need to have an eye on the security of the data and do whatever we can to protect that data as it flows in and out and through and is stored by our applications. So what I'm going to do in this session is just take a brief walk through some of the basic encryption technologies and security technologies that are available throughout the Synergy toolset and at least make sure you all know what's available and how to go about using each one of those things. So we're going to be largely talking about over the wire security. We're going to be talking about TLS for websites and web services. We're going to be talking about, well, what about encryption over the wire with the Synergy specific products like XF Server, XF Server Plus, SQL Open Net that in turn serves SQL Connection and the XFODBC API, all of which are things that talk over the network. And we'll wrap the session up later with a brief introduction to the subject of the encryption of data at rest and how do we go about encrypting data that is stored within the fields in our files. If you're not familiar with it, you probably need to be. Europe's new General Data Privacy Regulation, or GDPR as it's commonly known, is in effect. It has been in effect since May the 25th of this year. And essentially what that gives people in Europe, not necessarily European citizens, people who are physically present in Europe, it gives them certain rights and things they can do. For starters, it means that anybody in Europe must opt in to having data about them, personally identifiable data about them collected. And interestingly enough, even though it's an EU law, it does affect all organizations who hold any data about any person in the EU. Okay, so that might be you. If you guys have a website or a mobile app that is usable by somebody who is physically located in the European Union and you hold any kind of personally identifiable data about that person, then you have certain responsibilities in terms of getting their approval to collect that information. You have to have mechanisms in place to expose the, what information you're storing about them. You are uh, required to dispose of that information once you can no longer prove a good business case for keeping the information. There are certain types of information that it is purely illegal to collect, and so on. So this affects businesses around the world. And like I say, all you have to do is be collecting information about anybody who is physically present in the, in the European Union. There are some companies who are saying, yeah, this is just common sense, and we're going to, we're going to implement these things globally. For example, Microsoft and Facebook are both examples of corporations who've said, we, even though this is not a requirement, we are going to implement these rules globally. <laughs> Facebook are probably regretting that position right now because they're potentially facing a $1.63 billion fine at the moment <laughs> related to a little breach they had recently. Again, a little bit more information. GDPR requires you to justify reasons for collecting data and storing it in the first place. It requires you to notify individuals if they request how that personal data is being processed. It requires you to delete personal data once you can no longer prove that you have a business case for keeping it. Interestingly enough, GDPR does not explicitly require any kind of encryption. It simply requires you to enforce security measures and safeguards, but nowhere in the regulations does it actually say you have to encrypt anything, which uh, I think is kind of interesting. But there are potentially very large fines for violators. Facebook, for example, just recently have been in the news because they had to log out 90 million users in order to invalidate their access tokens because of a breach that they'd had. And apparently, they're, like I say, they're facing a 1.63, or up to a $1.63 billion fine related to that right now, uh, or maybe. Also, you know, that's Europe putting these kind of rules in place. California are doing their trend setting thing again and basically doing something or looking at doing something very similar over here. California has a Consumer Privacy Act of 2018, which has been passed. Um, it's, still being, it's still being worked through and, and, and uh, modified, but it's going to come into force in 2020. And that basically gives people in California very similar rights and privacy expectations as well. It doesn't go quite as far as GDPR. It does uh, require organizations to inform people of what data is being held, why it was collected, who it's being shared with. 
It does bar companies from selling that data without permission. However, one of the early criticisms of California's environment is that it does not prevent companies giving that information away for free. And also, it does not prevent companies charging you more for a certain product or service if you opt out of having your data collected and used, which is another early criticism. It is early days, it's still a work in progress, but interestingly enough, this law received unanimous approval in both the Assembly and the Senate. So this is a popular thing that's going on and it is widely expected for other states to follow suit. So the GDPR requirements are just the beginning and it's coming to the US as well. First thing, let's talk about TLS for websites and web services. TLS is the in vogue name, it stands for Transport Layer Security. It's the in vogue name for what we used to refer to as SSL or HTTPS. You know, both of those terms have kind of been deprecated right now, but Transport Layer Security is basically what that means. It's the encryption of data flowing over the web. You need to be aware, if you're not already, that more and more as time goes by, particularly this year, we've seen a lot of changes in this area, search engines and even web browsers now are starting to actively promote TLS sites over non-secure sites. So if you're running any kind of web service or website via HTTP without security, you should expect that maybe Google's not going to point people to your site anymore, or certainly less. Um, you know, if they're searching for a certain product or service and there are TLS sites available and your site is not protected by TLS, you're probably not going to be anywhere close to the top of the list at this point. And the writing seems to be on the wall that at some point they're going to just consider anything that doesn't have TLS protection to be insecure and not serve up those results. And more and more you would expect that browsers, you know, you, you've all seen the warning in the browser, you go to the, a certain site and the browser says, well, this may not be secure, right? And you have to go to advanced and say, yes, I really want to go there. Expect that to happen more and more. So at best, users may have to accept a security warning to get to an unprotected site. And at worst, they may not be in the future allowed to get to that site. So if you've got HTTP anywhere at this point in time, and you know, it was a common practice a few years ago to have a corporate website, for example, that maybe had a customer portal or whatever, and just use TLS to protect the login part of the site. That's really no longer effective these days because search engines and browsers are going to prevent users more and more from getting to that site in the first place. Also, be aware there's a new thing that's kind of coming and becoming more popular now called HTTP Strict Transport Security, or HSTS. HSTS is a mechanism to further improve web security. Essentially, what you've got to realize is that when you type a URL into a browser, that's just the beginning. That one HTTP request, typically for most websites these days, even for something as simple as the Google homepage, translates into potentially or likely hundreds if not thousands of actual HTTP requests. Every little bit of CSS and JavaScript and every image and every this, that and the other, if you use a, a tool like Fiddler, for example, to watch the requests that are coming just because you type in Microsoft.com, that could easily be 500 individual requests to various resources on the internet. So. HSTS basically is a mechanism for your website or for a website to inform a browser that we support HSTS. Everything you get from us, every additional reference for downloading images and CSS and JavaScript and content, we promise they will all be protected by TLS. So the browser, if it finds any link to anything in your web page or anything that results from that, will refuse to download the page. Okay, so it's a contract from your website saying everything here is protected and encrypted. And it's a great way of, of avoiding man-in-the-middle attacks. A man-in-the-middle attack might be where somebody intercepts one of those requests for a piece of JavaScript that's coming from a web page, and because it's not protected by HTTPS, just injects a new copy of it that does something different. So HSTS is the way of avoiding that, and it's becoming a lot more popular. Okay, so with that background in place, let's start to look at, at specific products and specific technologies. XF Server, XF Server Plus, SQL OpenNet, and HTTP API are all places in Synergy where you can choose to do over-the-wire encryption. It is not done by default anywhere, so if you want to enable this kind of encryption, then you, know, you have to go and physically do something about it. We're also going to look at, as I mentioned, encryption of data at rest in data files. And realize that Synergy doesn't do any encryption. We're not in the encryption business, so we use OpenSSL like most of the rest of the world does. 
So all of these encryption technologies in Synergy require and leverage functionality provided by the OpenSSL product set. So let's talk about XF Server to start with. Obviously with XF Server, we're transmitting data backwards and forwards over the wire. You can optionally enable encryption of that data over the wire. XF Server supports two encryption modes. You can either turn on master mode or slave mode. If you enable master mode, then all packets in and out of that XF Server instance on that whatever port you're running it on will be encrypted. If you enable slave mode, you can choose on a channel by channel basis which channels you encrypt. So you can encrypt the interaction with the payroll data perhaps, but not the interaction with the inventory file or something like that, if that's appropriate. The way you enable encryption with XF Server is there is, a, well, there's several ways, but um, if you're in slave mode, if you're in master mode, everything has to be encrypted and you have to start XF Server with encryption. We'll look at how to do that shortly. But if you're in slave mode, you can choose to optionally use encryption for a channel by using the slash encrypt open option when you use the open statement. If you do so and the server does not have encryption enabled, then there's a specific error that you'll get, error client error, if encryption is unavailable. There is also an open statement option to allow you to specify a security compliance level slash SCL. We'll talk a little bit more about what the security compliance level is in a moment, but it's your way of ramping up the level of encryption that's used, and there are certain defaults in place. We'll talk about that again in a moment. There is also an SDMS file creation option that you can basically embed a little flag into the header area of an ISAM file that basically indicates to the Synergy runtime that this particular ISAM file may only be opened if encryption is present. So if you've got a file that has sensitive data in it, that's a great way of indicating that to the runtime environment and the runtime will force encryption to be used to access that data. Setting up for XF server encryption, basically we are going to install and configure OpenSSL. I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail about that. I've got one slide about it right at the end, but there is some fairly detailed documentation in the Synergy docs about how to do that. Once you've done that, you're gonna use the OpenSSL utility to create a cryptographic certificate file. Again, there are examples of the commands in the documentation on how to do that. Also in my examples that I'll give you URLs to get to, there are little batch files that show you examples of how to create a certification authority and how to use that to sign a self-signed certificate. Self-signed certificates are gonna be great for development and testing, possibly even for internal use with something like XF Server. But if you're going out with anything public on the internet and allowing people to get to it, then as with anything else, you need to get a real certificate from a, a valid certification authority. So you generate a certificate. Um, you can call it anything you want, but if you name it rcindy.pem and put it in the dblder directory, then XF Server will find it and use it by default. That one, you just turn on encryption and it will, that's the default place it looks for a certificate. Or you can name it via a minus cert command line option or a slash certificate on OpenVMS when you start XF Server, or when you register the XF Server Plus service, actually. Also, if you are going to do any kind of encryption, remember that all of these cryptographic certificates have timeout dates. So make sure you set yourself a reminder somewhere to go create a new one before it times out because you're going to lose access to your data at some point if you don't do that. So it's pretty critical to remember to renew these certificates on a periodic basis before they expire. Again, if you're creating self-signed certificates, you get to control what the expiration period is but just be aware of that. This slide has an, uh, an example of some of the commands. Here we're creating a local, we're using the OpenSSL command line utility to, to create a local certification authority, and then the example commands below, create a request and sign it. Again, I won't linger on this because the, uh, there are some batch files in my example code that contain exactly this, and you can uh, use them and refer to them. In terms of configuring XF Server for encryption, if you're on a, a Unix or Linux or a VMS platform, then you're going to modify the command line that you use to register the XF Server service. So there is a minus encrypt equals master or slave to turn on encryption and specify the mode. Minus cert specifies the certificate file. Minus cipher, low, medium, or high. The way that OpenSSL works is it categorizes all of the ciphers that it supports into a low security, medium security, high security. So you don't pick an actual cipher that you want to use. You say, I want medium security or high security. And depending on what system you're on and what version of OpenSSL you've got, that will translate into a certain cipher strength. You can interrogate the environment to find out what that means if you wish to do so. 
You can also specify a security compliance level, which right now I believe is zero or one and we default to zero. If you're on Windows and you're using the SIM config utility, then there's, you literally check enable encryption, master or slave mode, specify the certificate file, low, medium, high, and so on. So you just configure it through the SIM config UI. So the cipher level, low, medium, or high, determines what kind of encryption ciphers you will be using. So each one of those maps to a certain collection of ciphers. Be aware that really you want to be using high, in my, in my opinion. Right now, I haven't got the very latest version of OpenSSL, but I've got a fairly recent version of OpenSSL. And on my Windows 10 system, which is fully up to date with Windows patches, low results in 56-bit, which is very low. SSL version 3, which is not considered secure anymore. Okay? Medium results in 128-bit SSL v3, which is not considered secure anymore. Okay? Only when you go to high do I get 256-bit AES over TLS 1.2. That's a secure environment right now. Okay? So you really want to be cranking this stuff up to the maximums would be my recommendation and make sure stuff is up to date. Um, security compliance level, the idea here is to give you a way of, of restricting what versions of TLS will be acceptable, the actual transport level security protocol. Right now, there are TLS 1.0, 1.1, and 1.2. Roger talked in some detail about this yesterday, and indeed, Roger is by far the expert in this area compared to myself. Again, what I would say is TLS 1.0 is really not considered secure anymore. You want to be at least TLS 1.1 and better still 1.2. By default, we default to zero, which says we will take the system default, which right now defaults to level one. Again, which includes TLS 1.0, which is not really considered secure anymore. This minus SCL is kind of a thing that we dropped in there fairly recently, and it's going to be implemented and enforced in Synergy version 11 going forward. So right now, it doesn't actually do an awful lot, but it's something you need to be aware of. And again, my recommendation would be manually crank it up to level 2 right now, and don't accept TLS 1.0 connections. It is kind of ineffective, even through 10.3.3f, but in version 11, this stuff will start to be enforced an awful lot more, okay? which might give you some pain because it will kind of force you to be up to date with OpenSSL and operating systems and stuff like that. If you're serious about security, everything has to be up to date. Runtime encryption verification. So if you're using XF server and you want to know if a channel is encrypted or not, you can use X called getFA with the SLE keyword, and that will return a value of one if that channel has been encrypted. If you want to know what cipher and what protocol are actually being used, you can use getFA to retrieve SLC, and that will give you, depending on how big a variable you give it, you know, if you give it something like an A128, you'll get this string that tells me I'm using AES256 with TLS 1.2, which I'm happy with that. That's a secure environment. But you have to kind of know what you're doing. If you want to verify if a file requires an encrypted channel, then isinfo channel netcrypt will tell you if that file is insisting on encryption via that flag in the file header. The demonstration I was going to use is literally I've got a program that opens a file that doesn't care about encryption, opens one way where we request encryption, and open the file where the file requires encryption. And I was going to go through and turn on those various modes in XF server and show you what opens and what fails and so on. It's a very simple little program. You can look at it yourselves. It's in my GitHub repository as a repo called XF Server Encryption. And like I say, there are a couple of batch files in there that will help you generate a certification authority and a self-signed certificate. So if you've never done that and you want a pointer, I think there's a cert directory and a CA directory. It's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, let's move on to XF Server Plus encryption. This will be a real fast discussion because it is very similar to XF Server encryption. XF Server and XF Server Plus are both rcindy.exe, right? It's the same server. So the process is basically the same. You create a digital certificate the same way. You start the XF Server Plus service with encryption the exact same way. It's the same command line options as XF Server. You have the same high, medium, low, slave or master mode, and so on. The meaning of master and slave with XF Server Plus is a little different. With master mode, all method calls to the server are encrypted. And with slave mode, only specific method calls are encrypted. And you can identify within the method catalog or through attributes in code, if that's the mechanism you're using, which of those methods require encryption. Other than that, it's very, very similar. 
in terms of what you need to do on the .NET clients. Encryption was added in xfnetlink.net back in 9.3. So Java was added a little bit later. And if you want to use the new security compliance level feature to ramp up the and, and get rid of the TLS 1.0, then 10.3.1b is the place that that was introduced. Requiring encryption in slave mode, you can either use the XF method attribute in code. If you are attributing your methods, then you can add the encrypt equals true to the method declaration. Or in the MDU, if you use the user interface, there's a little enable encryption box on the method definition that you can specify. So that would require encryption to be enabled in order to call that method. With XF Netlink Synergy, if anybody's using Rx subr, then you append slash encrypt to the name of the method that you're calling through that remote method call in Synergy. In terms of configuring XF Netlink clients for encryption, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail here, but there's a recommended setting that you set in Windows itself to define what acceptable security ciphers are available, and you use the group policy utility. You go through this path and make sure that the SSL cipher suite order setting is enabled. I won't go into a lot of detail about this because there's a whole section in the documentation. When you read about setting up XF Server Plus for encryption, there's a whole discussion about this. It isn't absolutely mandatory that you go through this process. The encryption will work. But again, it helps ensure that the appropriate cipher suites are available on that Windows system. But it is a client-side thing, which you may not have access to in all cases. And there's also one thing you need to be aware of, which is when you're doing encryption for XF Server Plus, when you create the certificate, if you do a self-signed certificate or if you request one from an actual certification authority, the common name field in the certificate must match the name of the host that you're connecting to, the DNS name. Okay? So you, know, you might be connecting from your client to your server with an IP address in the configuration. Probably not a great idea to embed an IP address inside a security certificate. So you want to probably switch to using a DNS name and embedding that DNS name in the certificate. If you fail to do that, you will get an error saying the remote certificate is invalid according to the validation procedure. And it took a little while of scratching heads a couple of weeks ago to figure out what on earth was going on with that. Configur configuring XF Netlink Java, well, nobody in the room is using it, but there's a, the Java runtime environment has a CA search utility. It's almost like the Windows certificate registry where certificates are registered with Windows. With Java, you use a, there's a utility called GenCert, and you use the CA search utility to register the server's certificate and make it trusted in the Java environment. You can also do it at runtime. There are uh, settings XFSSL cert file and XFSSL password that allow you to, um, uh, uh, sorry, that's in the configuration file, or there's some runtime methods to name the certificate that's going to be trusted. OK, let's move on to talk about SQL OpenNet. So SQL OpenNet basically is the network protocol that is responsible for doing either SQL connection API from a Synergy program to a database if it's over the network, so if you're using a net colon connection string or is the protocol or the service and protocol that's used to serve out XFODBC data, again, if it's a remote connection via a net colon connect string. This support was actually added fairly recently, so it's only been supported since 10.3.3. So if you need open net encryption, you have to be at least 10.3.3 or higher. To enable open net encryption, yet again, you generate a cryptographic certificate using the OpenSSL utility. And when you configure OpenSSL, I'll talk about that later, normally with Synergy, if you're doing encryption stuff, you drop the OpenSSL libraries into the DBL bin directory. We used to find them anywhere through path and things like that, but the problem is that most applications ship OpenSSL assemblies these days. So it's really hard to rely on path and other mechanisms like that because there's probably 15 different versions on your system with all the applications that have been shipped with it. So generally, you drop the SSL DLLs in DBL bin. If you're doing it with OpenNet, you have to also drop those assemblies into the connector directory, which is the Synergy DE connect directory, in order for the OpenNet server to find them. Once you've got that certificate and you've got the OpenSSL configuration in place, when you start the OpenNet server, so that's done through either a VTX net D or a VTX net 2 command, you add the minus E option. And there are some command line options that allow you to specify the certificate and the, the compliance level that you want and all of that kind of thing, similar to XF Server. One thing to note is generally, a cryptographic certificate generally is protected by a password that you enter when you create the request. 
and you have to provide that password in order to use that certificate. With the SQL Open Net encryption, there is no mechanism to provide that password. So the certificate that you generate for OpenNet must not include a passphrase. Okay? And the way you achieve that is there's an OpenSSL command line called, um, when you do the OpenSSL req command to create the certificate request, there's an optional command line option, no DES, which prevents the password being used. Okay? And that's a requirement if you want to prevent the password being present at all in the, in the certificate file. And that's a requirement if you want to encrypt open net configurations. Install and configure open. If you're doing SQL connection, so you're running Synergy code as a client to an encrypted server, then you also need the OpenSSL configured on those client systems if it's not the same machine. So to enable open net encryption on the server, depending on your platform, you either edit opennet.srv, startnet, or net.com depending on whether you're on Windows, Unix, Linux, or OpenVMS. And in all of those files, you will see a command line that says either vtxnetd with a bunch of command line options or vtxnet2 if you're using the non-multi-threaded server. And you simply add minus E, certificate file, the key file for the certificate, and the TLS versions that you're willing to accept. If you want to verify that it's enabled, if you have logging enabled on OpenNet, you will see a couple of messages in the log file, SSL enabled, and this SSL compile library, and it's telling you what versions of things are in use and so on. If you see other things like no such file or directory or problems getting password, then you've got some kind of configuration issues, or your certificate has a password in it and it's not allowed to, things like that. The way that OpenNet encryption works is once encryption is specified on the server, all connections will be encrypted. Okay? There is one thing that you can do, um, this is the cause of some misunderstanding. When you're configuring an ODBC data source, there are some fields in the bottom of the DSN definition that say SSL, TLS level, certificate file. Those are not required in order to have an encrypted connection. If the server has encryption enabled, all connections are encrypted. What those fields allow you to do is specify that encryption is required. Okay, so if you have a DSN on a client and you say SSL yes, then the client will refuse to connect to the server if encryption is not enabled. If SSL is set to no, it will connect whether it's encrypted or not, it'll still connect. Okay, so that's a little bit strange. HTTP API encryption, this one's real simple. If you're using the HTTP API as a developer, simply insist on using HTTPS, period. It's really dodgy to be connecting to HTTP services these days. That's really it, just insist on connecting, you know, refuse to interact with HTTP services. Yeah, if it's maybe something little and unconsequential and internal, I guess you can probably get away with it, but it's really frowned upon and considered pretty bad practice these days. Encrypting data at rest. So the encryption of data at rest basically says our data file or our data files have got some kind of sensitive information in them. Therefore, we'd like to try and do something about that and we want to start encrypting data within those files or certain fields. So we're talking about targeted encryption here. We're not talking about encrypting the entire disk, although clearly the entire disk might be encrypted at a hardware level already, but that really only gives you protection against somebody physically removing that drive and trying to use it in different machines. So what we're talking about here probably is saying this field in a record contains a social security number or an account number or a password or something like that, and we really better encrypt that information in order that if somebody gets inadvertently gets access to the file, they can't read that data. So in Synergy, in the runtime since 9.3, it says down there, we've had three routines, X call data encrypt, data decrypt, and data salt IV. And these are used to encrypt and decrypt data in memory that you can then write that data to a variable and store it out to a file. So to encrypt and decrypt data, you use the data encrypt and decrypt routines you specify the cipher level that you want to use and the data that you want to encrypt and you provide a password or a key, essentially, and those things are all combined to encrypt the data. You can optionally, if you wish, provide something called SALT and IV, initialization vector, and these are random value mechanisms that are used to improve the efficiency of the cipher that you're selecting and therefore improve the resulting encryption. <laughs> 
One thing to be aware of with data encrypt and decrypt is an encrypted version of data is almost always longer than the original version of the data. So if you've got an existing social security number in a D9 field, it's going to be bigger than nine once you've encrypted it. So now we're into potentially changing record layouts. It depends whether you've got some spare space after the field. You might have to do a file conversion. So there are some things that make this potentially painful. In terms of specifying the cipher that you wish to use, these are pretty much the choices that you have. Triple DES3 key mode, AES128, 192, or 256. Again, all I'm going to say is that you know I'm probably going to go to 256-bit here and make that my recommendation. If you're going to do it, why use a weaker cipher? Data padding, therefore, when you encrypt some data, it's going to get bigger, probably. It depends whether it's on a cipher boundary already. So if you use triple DES encryption, triple DES uses an 8-byte block size. So if your data is not a multiple of 8 bytes, then it's going to grow up to the next 8-byte boundary when you encrypt it. AES uses a 16-byte block size. So if you happen to have an A16 or an A32 or a, you know, whatever, um, then you, you're in luck. The data's not going to grow. But if it happens to be a, you know, an A17, now it's going to become an A32 or up to an A32. Okay? It may not be the whole length, but it will be bigger. So PKCS padding is what this is called, and it's used if the data is not a multiple of the cipher block size. If it is, then you can suppress the padding, but again, only if the data is the exact size of the cipher that you're using or a multiple of it. So encrypting a field usually requires a change in length. Strengthening the encryption through this use of SALT and IV, as I mentioned, the data SALT IV mechanism generates random SALT and IV values. The SALT is used to derive the encryption key from the password. So basically, it takes the password you provide and the SALT value you provide and hashes a bunch of stuff together and, and produces the actual encryption key that's going to be used. And the initialization vector is used to randomize the resulting encrypted data. So the data is encrypted and then randomized based on the initialization vector. Okay. The SALT and IV values are not considered sensitive information. But be aware that without them, you can't decrypt the data. So they're not considered sensitive like the key is, but they are critical information that once you've generated and used it, you must not lose them. Okay? Otherwise, you cannot decrypt your data. Okay? So if used, do not lose the values. Make sure you store them somewhere securely and have access to them. It's fine to write them to a file. They're not considered sensitive, but make sure you've got copies of that thing around somewhere that you're not going to lose it. Okay? One of the hardest things in all of this is choosing a password and then figuring out how to store it in a secure way. That's the key to the data, right? If someone's got the password and potentially the SALT and IV values, then they can decrypt your data. So when choosing a password, all I can recommend is make them long and make them random. And you've got to figure out a way of how you're going to store them securely while still making them available to the application at runtime. Because the application needs to have them in memory, at least. And you've got to get that data in there somehow but you probably don't just want to store your encryption password in a file on disk that somebody could just edit and view. And I'll talk more about this, and I'll show you one example of how to solve that problem in a few minutes' time. So storing the password and where to do that and how to do that while still getting it into the application. You know, do, you, do you really want to run up the application the first time and have it prompt an administrator to say, please enter your security encryption key? Probably not. But how else are you going to do it in a way that's secure? One suggestion is, and I think Richard already mentioned this in one of his sessions, and I'm sure Google and Amazon probably have equivalent services. Azure has a service called the Azure Key Vault, which is accessed via a RESTful API, like Jeff was just showing. And it provides a secure way of storing information online and retrieving it via a RESTful API. And it becomes Microsoft's problem to make it secure and give you access to it. Certainly, I've, I've done one of these things, I've got one of these things, and you provide the key value and say, go store this secret value as a named thing, and you get to see the value one time when you first paste it in there. And beyond that, you have to actually get an access token from Azure AD in order to authenticate against the service to retrieve it back. But at no point can you go to the Azure portal and visualize that thing anymore. It has to be done through authentication tokens. I'll show you an example of that in a few minutes' time. In fact. I wasn't going to do the second demo, but I will. I'll run the Azure one. These two demos, and again, they're both in my GitHub repo. Data encryption demo is just a real simple example of using data encrypt and data decrypt 
and a, I think I just use a hard-coded GUID as the key in that case, which is not realistic, and it says in there in comments, do not do this in production, but it's more about showing you how to use the encrypt decrypt and showing you that the field size grows and so on. To save a little bit of time, I will simply show you the second demo. So the second demo is called Azure Key Vault Demo, and it's basically the same code, but it goes out to Azure and uses Azure Key Vault to retrieve the encryption key. And I thought this one might be of interest because there's some sample code in here that you might be able to use. So here's the program. It's simply, you know, I have my record here, my employee record, and you'll see I've got my social security number encrypted, has an A11 for the unencrypted data. Uh, I guess it's stored in with the dashes. Um, and SSN padding, so I pad up to the 16 bytes of the AAS key that I'm using. So I've built in that extra five bytes of padding into my record. Clearly that may have required a file conversion. And then all I'm doing here is I've got this routine called get encryption keys that returns to me a password, the salt, and the IV, and an error message if something goes wrong. So the magic voodoo stuff happens back behind there, and we'll look at that in a moment. And then all it does is it uses those passwords and salt IV values to encrypt the data. Um, it displays the data, encrypts the data, displays it again, decrypts the data, displays it again. So when we run this program, all we see is, when we run this program, we simply see the original value of the data, there's the encrypted data in the record, and there's the decrypted data. The record length is appearing to change here because there's some binary characters in here that are screwing up the terminal I.O. Um, but you can see how the data is longer and encrypted. Okay? The, the clever part of this demo and the bit you might be able to reuse is there is a class in here called Active Directory Client. So the way this works is you create an Azure Key Vault and then you go into Active Directory and you create an application ID that is associated with that Key Vault and that application has a unique ID and a secret value Armed with that information, you go to Azure Active Directory to get an authorization token to access the underlying service. That gives you a JWT token like we saw yesterday, and you then present that JWT token when talking to Key Vault to retrieve the named item. Okay, so that's what this code does. So Active Directory client simply takes a, uh, where are we, um, login.windows.net, AD tenant ID is my unique value of my Azure Active Directory in my Azure account. And I'm going to the OAuth2 token endpoint and I'm requesting client credentials for a named application ID and the secret value that goes along with that. Okay, and I've got these, where have I got these things hidden? Oh, they're dot defined somewhere out of the way that you guys can't see for the reasons that Richard mentioned earlier. <laughs> okay. Um, you can look at the code. The code will, the code will uh, reveal some secrets. Um, anyway, so we create this um, Azure Active Directory client, and then we call get app access token. And all that routine does is, guess what? It's a RESTful web service call. So we're calling out to login.windows.net, passing the AD tenant ID, OAuth token, providing the app ID and the secret for the Key Vault service. And there's the HTTP post that is the RESTful web service call from Synergy. And then I take the, this is just extracting the access token that comes back uh, and returning it. Okay, so at, uh, Azure AD client is used to get an act access token. And then I use um, Key Vault client, which is this guy here, which basically has a, a thing called, um, so I construct a Key Vault client passing in the authorization token, and then I call the get secret method, which is again just another RESTful service call to the Key Vault URL secrets, the name of the secret, the version of the secret, the version of the API that I'm using, and it returns the, um, it returns the, uh, some JSON with the value in that I simply extract and return back, and that's used as the password. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into more detail about it. This is, like I say, you can download this from this URL as your Key Vault demo and, and step through it. But you should be able to reuse that code if you want to access as your Key Vault. Preparing to use encryption, basically, no matter what these types of encryption you want to use, you have to have OpenSSL available on your system. 
on Windows. Windows, it's kind of a challenge because there's no obvious central place to go to get OpenSSL. You have to kind of figure out where you're going to get it from. There's some pointers. If you go to OpenSSL.org, they have a page that they call Downloads that gives you a few pointers of other places you can look. But you have to kind of either build it yourself or trust someone else to do it for you. So it's kind of interesting. On Unix, Linux, and OpenVMS, OpenSSL is provided as a package on the operating system through whatever the standard package distribution mechanism is for that version of Linux, or VSI provide it for OpenVMS, and HP used to provide it for OpenVMS, and so on. Also, you know, if you're interested in security, then remember that ISAM has an option, or Synergy ISAM has an option that's called Erase on Delete. So if you've got secure information, then you might want to consider enabling Erase on Delete as well, so that when you wipe data out of your files, it's gone completely, not just sitting around on the disk, but not in the index of the file. So that's another thing that's relative to uh, security. When you've installed OpenSSL, like I mentioned, typically you want to be taking the two OpenSSL DLLs, and this is heavily discussed in the documentation, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but generally you want to be dropping them into the DBL bin directory, and you want to be dropping them into the connect directory if you're doing open net encryption. On Linux and Unix and OpenVMS, there's no pre-configuration. If you've got OpenSSL installed, then you should be good to go. But it... Seriously, I think I've mentioned this already, OpenSSL versions, the latest stable version is 1.1.0. There is a long-term support version out there, 1.0.2, which is, I think, probably where most of us are at right now. That is only supported until the 31st of December 2019, which isn't that long away now. So the point of this is, if you're doing any kind of encryption, you need to keep things up to date. OpenSSL, your operating system, you know, clients and servers, Windows patches, Linux patches, is kind of critical. There's no point doing encryption if all of a sudden the version of OpenSSL you're using gets a little bit old and the ciphers it's using as a result are not considered secure anymore and all of a sudden you lose ground. And what was secure today likely won't be considered secure in, in two or three years' time. So keeping everything up to date. Certainly if you're using any of these older versions, 101 or back, they are no longer considered secure and you really need to address that. You know, there is a cost to encryption. I already mentioned that key management is one of the hardest things. How are you going to securely store your keys but in a way that your application can access them when it needs to? There is a performance impact. You know, encrypting and decrypting stuff is not free. It takes CPU cycles. How much of an impact that is, I can't tell you. It depends how much of it you do and how fast your network, uh, CPUs are and all kinds of things. But this stuff is not free. Things will slow down because you encrypt them. That's just a fact of life. Also, bear in mind, if you encrypt data in your ISAM files, you have now got binary data in those ISAM files. So don't be using ISLOAD, don't be using fconvert, or if you, well, sorry, fconvert is fine, but you must use counted files. So don't be doing an fconvert minus ot to a text file anymore because you will screw up the data. So use encryption when you have to. You know, clearly some of us have to through HIPAA, PCI, or whatever those legal requirements are, but also use it when it's the right thing to do. Let's, let's be encrypting people's personal data. And all too often I've seen it. A lot of us have some work to do in this area. We all know we should be doing it, but we don't always do it. And I think that's getting to be a big concern these days. And, yeah, I've already spoken to this one, operating system security updates, critical. You can't ignore Windows updates and Linux patches and OpenVMS patches as they come along. They're not as frequent. But if it's a security update, it, it, it's affecting encryption and ciphers and things like that. And it's really critical that you take those updates. Synergy version 11, the default compliance level, that minus SCL thing, is going to go from 1 to 2. So all of a sudden, things are going to get elevated and we're going to start requiring higher levels of TLS to be used. Likely, what's going to happen is we're probably, by that time, going to enforce a minimum of TLS 1.2. So that, in turn, has an impact on you're going to have to have certain versions of OpenSSL and certain versions of Windows and certain versions of Linux and stuff like that. So you, know, you need to keep up to date with what those requirements are. So the top question is, any consideration to using a more modern OpenSSL branch like LibreSSL? So internally, we've kicked around uh, the idea of moving to an abstraction here so that we can use um, more than one SSL provider, in general, preferring whatever the platform offers. But yes, that would be included in that, although these are 
very internal discussions. Uh, so you know, we haven't really moved forward with that. If you have a requirement for that for any reason, definitely talk to us about that requirement. Uh, when using the data encrypt to encrypt data at rest, is the data stored contain binary values or only normal printable ASCII characters? Yes, it does contain binary values. And is encrypted data decrypted when queried via XFODBC? No, it is not. I apologize, I should have mentioned that. Yes, there is no solution right now for decrypting data via ODBC if it's encrypted in the file. If it's encrypted in the file, you cannot access that value through ODBC. All right, thank you, Steve. Thank you.